Okay, let's start this. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us today. My name is BC Agiremi. I'm a water scientific energy specialist and water disability focal point for UNICEF based in New York. You are welcome to this session. And uh, before I go further, let's go to some housekeeping issues. Please keep yourself muted and chat and post will be unpartable. Please place your comments and questions in partable. And I want to flip your screen to see what you're doing in both Zoom and partable. Post all your questions to the presenters and panelists in partable and efforts will be made to address all these questions. For the case um, caption, you can, we have, we have two options for that. You can tag with large transcription in, in and off individually. There are two ways for attendees to display closed captions or subtitles in the full transcript. Subtitle will display at the bottom of the screen. The viewer will have the option to hide subtitles and that the full transcript opens in a new window and display a timestamp and label script created in real time. So these are just some few um, um, housekeeping issues. More we provided as more forward. But let me just uh, inform us that this session is being organized by CEDA, Water Aid, World Bank Group, International Disability Alliance, FH International, Human Rights of Women and Girls with Disability in Uganda, Special Olympics, Organization of Persons with Disability, and UNICEF. As I, as I get to see the session, all the sessions we will be heard from Organization of Persons with Disabilities and World Stakeholders and learn practical approaches to making what watch climate resilient and disability inclusive for all users. Speakers of this event have been carefully put together and they come from governments of Denmark and Uganda, the representative for Organization of Persons with Disability in Ethiopia and the Pacific. And of course, we have a senior uh, policy leader from Water Aid. Most of our speakers are persons with disabilities themselves. So you hear directly from them how to make climate resilient watch more disability inclusive. For more information about our speakers, please go on the, on the session page on the party table. You will see the bounce of all of them. And as part of this session, again, we plan to launch a new resource page on disability inclusive watch. And, and this new page has been set up as a joint collaboration by the International Disability Alliance, UNICEF, World Bank, Water Aid, FH International, the Special Olympics, at the International Center for Evidence in Disability at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine to signpost and share resources on watch and disability from different organizations working development and international context. The resources include practical guidelines and policy briefs and are for a range of policy and practitioner audiences. The selection of audiences will be reviewed and updated regularly. Please visit the website and you're going to see quite a lot of documents that have, that have been put together. And, now, and I'm happy to inform you that at the end of this session, that the call for action uh, that will guide the way move forward on this particular issue. So at this stage, I think it's good to warm up. It's good for us to start knowing each other. So we'll go to the poll now and um, let's know each other. Let's go to the poll. And um, you're feeling in the poll, uh, you're feeling um, your, your name, your organization and your location and what interests you in joining this event. Uh, it's a way of warming up. So let's go to partable and put uh, and put on the poll this information and that really help us to know who our target audience is for this event. While we are doing that, permit me uh, to invite um, Thomas and Ken Christ Christensen, the climate ambassador for government of Denmark, to present the keynotes and open remarks for this session. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you very much, BC, and thank you very much for inviting me and, and the government of Denmark to uh, introduce this topic. Uh, I hope everybody listening in is safe and well, um, and that we uh, can leave this pandemic uh, behind us uh, in a not too distant future. We had all wished to be in Stockholm in person for this, uh, for this get together. Um, uh, friends, we are, we are at a very timely and important uh, moment uh, uh, this year. We are four weeks out from the UN General Assembly and we are 69 days out from COP26, which will have a major focus on resilience and adaptation and with that on water and, and vulnerability. Um, and, and this happens at a juncture where we know that we are not on track to meet the 
sustainable development goal number six, the water goal. Um, one in three people do not have access to safe drinking water. Two out of five people do not have a basic hand washing facility with soap and water and more than 673 million people still practice open defecation. Um, the recent SDG six progress report really is dire reading. And at the same time, climate change uh, is putting and will put even more pressure on the availability of safe water and sanitation, especially through increased number of extreme floods. And what we have seen this summer in, 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 in Europe, in China, and other parts of the world is just a harbinger of things to come. Um, this is highlighted in the IPCC report published just a few weeks ago. And with these trends, uh, as they continue, an increased number of people will not have access to safe water and sanitation. They will, in fact, be left behind. Um, most climate impacts have to do with water, too much water, too little water, polluted water. And these water-related climate risks already have severe impacts on people's well-being, health, job opportunities, and economic potential. As the effects of climate change on water become more and more visible, strengthening resilience becomes an increasing priority. And as we all know, the impacts of change are felt most by the vulnerable communities, not least people living with disability. The answer is simple, but not easy. We need to urgently scale up our investments into the water sector. And we need to ensure that WASH infrastructure and services are sustainable, safe, and resilient to climate related risks. There is strong evidence that structural inequality means lower access to water and sanitation, less voice in water resource management and decision making, and greater vulnerability to climate change impacts. For this reason, we need to contribute to inclusive wash infrastructure and to the inclusion and engagement of citizens as partners, rather just as beneficiaries. So two central points. First, one billion people globally have some form of disability. 80% of those live in developing countries and 46% of all older people have a disability. These are staggering figures. Persons with disability frequently face disadvantage and are more affected by climate change. Yet the resources, information and services needed to help build resilience are often not accessible. Persons with disabilities are also underrepresented at all levels of wash and climate work planning, and their needs are often not considered in infrastructure. As with all good development, it is critical with inclusive approaches and to involve a broad range of stakeholders, including people with disabilities in the design and implementation of climate and wash work. It is therefore great that this session and the organizers are for the third year running, giving space to organizations of people with disabilities at this conference. Second, the climate crisis is also a water crisis, and they both need to be tackled with urgency. Denmark is committed to do our part and to contribute to improved access to wash services, as well as raising climate ambitions. That is why access to water and climate change adaptation form a key element in Denmark's global strategy for climate action launched last year. Climate change adaptation and resilience initiatives is a central part of the Danish climate diplomacy efforts, which I lead. One of the specific objectives of the strategy is to significantly upscale our engagements about improved access to water for the poorest and most vulnerable communities, especially in Africa. And we have already gone a long way towards meeting that objective with substantial increased investments in improving climate resilience, wash services in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. The new Danish strategy for development cooperation, which was agreed to in our parliament uh, just a few weeks ago, further underlines Denmark's increased engagement around climate change adaptation and water. A critical pillar of the strategy is to lead efforts in the fight against the climate and environment crisis and build resilience for the people that need it most. No one should be left behind. Denmark stands ready to increase our efforts with concrete actions, bilateral efforts, multilateral cooperation, and innovative financing. 
the details of what we will be doing will be announced uh, over the course of the next weeks, including at UNGA and at COP26. And with that, I wish you all a fruitful session and thank you very much for giving me the floor. Yeah, thank you so much, Thomas. Thanks so much for the keynote and opening remarks. And thanks to the government of Denmark on climate change and disability inclusive wars. We really appreciate all your contribution and support. Uh, before we go ahead, please, uh, colleagues, let's go on, on Patebu uh, to provide information in the, in the poll, as um, we mentioned earlier. Uh, sorry, we are having a true platform of we have to work with Zoom and Patebu. The chat and the poll is on Patebu. Please go to Patebu and provide the information on your name, your organization, and why what interests you in joining this session. So thank you so much. So let's go ahead and um, we'll just um, uh, spend the next few minutes to show a video from Water Aid on Disability Inclusive Watch. This again is very uh, relevant to the topic we are discussing. So please let's add video and enjoy it. Water and sanitation are human rights and hygiene is essential to meeting these rights. But some people are excluded from wash services or decision-making because of who they are, where they live, or what group they belong to. WaterAid aims to tackle the inequalities that prevent low-income and marginalized people from realizing their rights to water and sanitation and practicing hygiene. We do this by using a rights-based approach in our WASH programs. This means working in partnership with marginalized groups and their representatives to identify and address barriers to WASH access and participation. The people most at risk of being left out must have adequate information about WASH services, understand their rights, and be able to actively participate in WASH management, activities and decision-making that impact their lives. Just sitting at the table is not meaningful participation and won't necessarily lead to empowerment. It is important for the people responsible for delivering services to understand the needs of different users and to be responsive to them. To realize the human rights to water and sanitation, we need strong wash systems that address everyone's needs. There is no one-size-fits-all solution to make our work inclusive and empowering. We need to do a range of different things adapted to the specific context while abiding by the principle of do no harm. Most importantly, we need to understand who is at risk of being left out and make sure they are part of developing the solutions. Inclusive and empowering practice must be part of all our work. I see your mute. Hello? Yeah. We, we hear. Yes, thank, thank, thank you so much um, for, for the video. And I think we have to invite Elam to um, take the next activity. Elam, over to you. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, hello from New York. My name is Elham Yusufian. Uh, I work for the International Disability Alliance as the Inclusive Humanitarian Action and Disaster Risk Reduction Advisor. In, in the next few minutes, we are going to talk about the concept of disability because we firmly believe that many of the issues that we just heard Ambassador explaining about um, lack of access to climate, uh, climate change uh, for persons uh, actions for persons with disabilities or lack of access to wash uh, in an inclusive way lies actually in the fact that uh, 
the concept of disability is a little bit unclear. So we are going to do a joint activity together. I request everyone to pay attention to this, um, our slide number two. Here you see that, all right, so please go to slide. We are seeing here a group of people who are trying to read an announcement about COVID-19. And then there is this uh, woman with visual import, uh, impairment who is just passing, but she cannot notice the announcement about um, COVID-19. So my question to, to, to you guys who are participating in this meeting is, where do you see the disability? And what risk this woman in this uh, illustration is facing? Please use the poll. Uh, I hope the poll is on the page and people can access it to provide your answers. Where do you see the disability in this picture? And I have my colleague Faith with me who is going to support us with uh, telling us a quick summary of what is being put on the poll. Faith, can you confirm that the poll is running and people are already answering your question? Yes, Elam, the poll is on and we're waiting for responses to come through. Yeah. Where do you see the disability? That there's no judgment, no <laughs> assessment in here. It's just about thinking together um, about the concept of disability. Do we have any okay, questions? I can. Yeah. Yes. Um, the quest, the answer to the question, what, what is the disability? Um, we're mm -hmm. getting the answer that the woman is blind. Yes. That's what comes to mind. Do how many of that answer we have? We have one answer so far. Yeah, that kind of represents um, the first imagination of disability. Uh, so let's move on to the next slide, which is another example. Here you see uh, that humanitarian staff are announcing uh, and there is a person with wheelchair joining and we can also see the sign language interpreter. Um, so here again, we have the same question. Where is the disability? And do you think that this group of people gathering face a risk? So try to think about where do you see the disability in this picture? All right, uh, Faith, do we have any answer to this question? Not, no, no answers yet. I'm still waiting uh, yeah. for- Colleagues, please go please. ahead. There is no one going to monitor <laughs> who is saying what, so it's, everything is uh, just for um, conversation purposes, no assessment. Yes, no we have we have answers now. Um, huh? What is the disability? Um, uh -huh. Hearing, um, deafness. Uh -huh. um, one says unsure. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, which is great. So. <laughs> yes. Okay. And Let's give it a few more seconds. If anyone wants to sh share anything about these two photos that we just saw, any other ideas about what is it? Where is the disability? Where do you see the disability? Any updates, Faith? No. No. Yes. No I updates can see. further. I can see more face as uh, wheelchairs, physical disability. Okay, we oh, are uploading yes. now, yes. Speech, mm -hmm. deafness. Yes. yes, all right. Mobility, walk, uh, physical, and the, mm -hmm. yeah, movement is the disability. So yes, so they that, see the disability the in the fact that one person cannot move, one person is a wheelchair user and has physical disability. And apparently there should be a deaf person in this group that someone is doing sign language interpretation. Okay, that's the first 
understanding of disability that uh, most people have. So let's move on to the next slide and see what does the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities say about definition of disability. So here we have, uh, of course, we have impairment. Someone has visual impairment. Another person has physical impairment. The other one has intellectual impairment. But does impairment equal disability? We're gonna discuss this a little bit together. What actually causes lack of ability or disability is not necessarily and solely the impairment, but it is the barrier that the person facing, the person facing. So in the first illustration, when we talked about uh, a woman who uh, is blind and okay, could not read that announcement. If there was the announcement put in braid or someone would read that announcement loud for that woman, then that woman could understand what is the announcement and she was not disabled. She was not uh, enabled to understand what is the announcement and just pass by. She would be informed and she could do whatever everyone else is required to do. Or in our second illustration, um, th this is true that there is a physical impairment, a uh, person using wheelchair, but this person is able to follow the conversation like any other person. So there is no lack of ability, there is no disability in, in the concept of understanding and participating in the conversation. But if somebody says to that person, hey, you have a disability, so you cannot maybe understand or doesn't talk to him because of he's using a wheelchair or uh, don't let him participate in the conversation. That's an attitude. Someone thinking that person who has a disability is not capable of having conversation. That means that uh, they have, there is an attitudinal barrier. Um, persons with disabilities can be from different ages, children, young, old, different gender identities, sexual orientation, different ethnic groups, and different impairments. So we are not talking about a homogeneous group. We are talking about a diverse group. Um, and as I said, the barriers can include physical barriers, uh, communication barriers, as we saw in the story of that woman uh, who couldn't understand the announcement because of the um, because of the uh, lack of communication in braille or in audio uh, can be attitudinal. As I told you, some people may think that people with disabilities cannot understand or communicate or uh, participate or institutional barriers like policies that discriminate against persons with disabilities. So for example, a government policy that says, we are not gonna employ persons with disabilities. That's an example of institutional barrier. So when there is an interaction between the impairment and one of these barriers, the result, result would be a discrimination, exclusion, and, um, and disability. And if there are no barrier, if there is an enabler, then that means that the person can participate, will be included, and there is no disability. So let's move on. Uh, so as I said, disability results from this interaction between uh, impairment and barriers. If there is the enabler, then disability will. Of barrier. So you see here the the definition of uh, disability based on the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. So maybe let's move to the next slide. Where is the barrier? Maybe instead of asking where is disability, we need to ask where is the barrier? Instead of looking at the person and oh, this is something wrong with you because you cannot see, because you cannot walk, because you cannot hear. Let's look at what is wrong with the society, what we could do differently so that everyone, regardless of their physical, sensory, intellectual, or uh, psychosocial differences can participate. So maybe we need to change the question. We need to ask, where is the barrier? 
and ask what is the info communication barrier? What is the physical barrier? What is the attitudinal barrier? Or what is the institutional barrier? All right, so this is what we want to talk about. Wanted to talk about the definition of disability. Uh, and I hope that it is helpful so that we can change our point of view, our lens. And I, I believe that if we change this point of view, many of the questions, challenges that we're going to hear about them during this session, we heard some of them so far, uh, will be resolved because uh, we are going to see the barrier, find the enabler, and resolve the challenge. Thank you so much, everybody, for your participation. I will be back with another activity later, hopefully. So let's go back to BC. BC, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think this is very good. And um, where is the barrier? I think that's a question that's been asked, and we need to identify this barrier. But before I go ahead, can you please continue to put your comments, your questions on the chat box in the party room? All your questions, comments are going to help us to really move forward on this agenda. Talk about where are the barriers. So let's learn more about the barriers uh, to watch for persons with disability by watching another video from What I Eat. It's a very short video, just a game for us to learn from that. So let's have the video, please, and enjoy it. Everyone has a right to water and sanitation, and hygiene is essential to meeting these rights. But everywhere, there are people and groups who are less likely to have their rights fulfilled because they are marginalized or excluded and have less power than others. Inequalities can exist because of who you are, where you live, what group you belong to, or your economic circumstances. Inequalities are often greater for women and girls, people with disabilities, older people, or those living with health conditions. Some people are more marginalized because of how different parts of their identity intersect. We need to look at all the factors that make someone's experience better or worse and understand who has power and who doesn't. People who are marginalized are more likely to face barriers to wash access and participation and have less power to change their situation. Barriers can be environmental, institutional or attitudinal. To identify barriers and possible solutions, we need to work closely with people experiencing or at risk of marginalization. This helps us tackle the barriers marginalized people are actually facing and not the barriers we think they are facing. Understanding and tackling barriers is a key step towards inclusive WASH for all. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think um, with that set of information, we are ready to go for another uh, round of discussions. Uh, now about sharing our experiences with organization of persons with disabilities on, from the field now. I mean, we've had quite a lot from um, in terms of enabling environment, but we want to hear from the field and practical experience. Uh, so we are, we are going to move on with um, inviting the uh, presentations from organization of persons with disability to share their experiences. Uh, we'll start, with, we have three of them. We'll start with the presentation from the Pacific Disability Forum, who could not really make it, but is setting that presentation pre-recorded. And um, I will invite um, Sanimili Tawake, who is the Regional Climate Change Coordinator of, of, of the organization, and also to thank um, Lera Mila and Kat, Kata, Katabuena Tawake, apology for that, for supporting this presentation. So let's have the presentation of Sanimali, please. No audio, please. I think you are muted.
Yes, can we have the presentation from the Pacific Disability Forum? Greetings from the Pacific Disability Forum. My presentation is on the climate change impact on persons with disabilities and the experiences they encounter in accessing water, sanitation, and hygiene services in the Pacific. The reality is persons with disabilities already face daily hardship in accessing adequate, safe water for drinking, hygiene and sanitation. There is an expectation that the 1.7 million persons with disabilities in the Pacific are exposed to increased lack of water due to climate change. Studies have shown the disaster and their aftermath have a huge impact on persons with disabilities. Studies also confirmed that there is a large tendency for persons with disabilities to be invisible and overlooked in emergency relief operations. In the face of climate crisis or when a disaster strikes, Persons with disabilities have difficulty reaching safe areas. They are separated from their families and friends. Also, they have difficulty in accessing vital emergency information or lose assistive devices such as wheelchairs, crutches, white canes, prosthesis, or hearing aids. Persons with disabilities who have other status face added disadvantages in having their needs met. In 2019, UNICEF promoted Menstrual Hygiene Management Day, which was on the 28th of May of the same year. In partnership with PDF, UNICEF, through its network, shared positive menstrual hygiene messages developed by women and girls with disabilities from Fiji. PDF in partnership with Water Aid Australia in 2020, together with several civil society organizations, social enterprises and businesses collaborated to improve menstrual health rights and outcomes for girls, women and gender diverse people in Fiji, Papua New Guinea, Samoa, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu. PDF with funding support from the Australian government and the Australian Pacific Climate Partnership Support Unit had commissioned a study on the impact of climate change on persons with disabilities in three Pacific Island countries, Kiribati, Tuvalu and Solomon Islands. PDF in the past through engaging with several agencies have also captured climate impact evidence in Fiji, which saw, which saw that the impact of climate change has forced many communities to internally migrate to areas where climate change impact is lower. This included relocation of communities from the coast to higher grounds or further inland, and therefore bringing persons with disabilities much more challenges. The migration takes place without proper knowledge on issues relating to disability access to essential services. The delay in having essential services in new locations, such as the absence of wash facilities, have far more impact on persons with disabilities, threatening their personal hygiene, food consumption, livelihood, and security. Anecdotes have shown that persons with disabilities, particularly women and girls with disabilities, are greatly affected when there is no water, particularly at times of menstruation. In evacuation centers, when safe, clean drinking water is not available and rebuilding of essential services takes a while, people with disabilities and their families are in far more worse situations. 
in places where water tanks are available, persons with disabilities cannot access water because water tanks are often placed in areas where physical access is a challenge. In addition, the lack of assistive devices prevents persons with disabilities to independently secure water from the water source. When persons with, persons with disabilities lose or damage their assistive devices during a disaster, these devices are not timely replaced. Shipments for assistive devices to Fiji take six months to a year, making response programs very slow and inefficient. In outlining a solution, PDF emphasized on some key principles, which included the central role of persons with disabilities, their families, and personal assistance, including their organizations, in voicing their own vulnerabilities, needs, and proposed solutions. A rights-based approach in line with the Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities points to governments as duty bearers to consider the needs of persons with disabilities when responding to climate crisis, including the full provisions of the components of the preconditions to inclusion of persons with disabilities during humanitarian situations. A twin track approach, which promotes both specialist disability initiatives designed to include and empower persons with disabilities and the mainstreaming of disability inclusion into all policies, strategies, and activities. The use of WHO community-based rehabilitation metrics as a framework outlining support to persons with disabilities to health, education, livelihood, social inclusion, and empowerment with the associated guiding principles of inclusion, participation, self-advocacy, accessibility, and sustainability. PDF believes that there is a critical need to end the cycle of poverty and disability. There are strong links between extreme poverty and disability, each resulting from the other. Ending the cycle must also include addressing discrimination and negative attitude which create barriers and exclusion, exacerbating the hardship persons with disabilities face. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Thank you so much uh, for this excellent presentation. Uh, without so much ado, um, to, to manage time very well, I would like to invite uh, Yusuf Padako uh, from Disability Development Initiative of Utopia. And Yusuf is the Director of Disability Development Initiative and um, they are based in Utopia. Over to Yusuf for your presentation, please. Hello. Welcome Hello. to my presentation on how to make wife facilities accessible. The presentation has introduction, definition of accessibility, and the national to focus on it, results from recent survey of demonstrating cases, and before I go to the details of the presentation, let me introduce myself. I am Yusuf Gadu, one of the founder and currently the executive director of Disability Development Initiative, DDI. DDI is a non-profit, non-religious, and non-political organization working towards creating accessible work. Accessibility, advocacy, economic empowerment of persons with disabilities, and community-based rehabilitation are among the key strategic issues of accessibility. Accessibility is a possibility for all citizens to participate equally. It is the reachability, functionality, and usability of an infrastructure, a product, an environment and sooner or later our vision, hearing, balance and memory gets weaker. We lose our strength and physical capacity. Our working and moving becomes slower and harder. Our time for reaction gets longer and it's more difficult to make decisions. Moreover, nobody knows what happens next. Hence, accessibility is investing into our own future. 
There are different forms of accessibility. To mention the major ones, communicative accessibility, informative accessibility, psychosocial accessibility, and physical accessibility. DTI's priority in implementing accessibility. It collects data and evidence on accessibility in schools, institutions, and service providers. It provides design and advice for improved accessibility with support from an association of architects and engineers in addition to its own experts. It trains architecture and engineering graduates of Addis Ababa University in accessibility and lobbying to the authorities for accessibility to be included in the formal curriculum. What to observe for accessibility? According to American Disability Act 2010, an accessible path for, of travel consists of walks and sidewalks, curb ramps, and other interior and exterior pediatric ramps, clear floor paths, restroom, and water taps. Accessible environment is to be used by everyone based on the concept of universal design. Universal design ranges from inclusive and non-discriminatory designs of products, cars, architecture and urban environment and infrastructure to IT and telecommunication. Universal design recognizes a wide spectrum of Let's see a practical example from recent survey by DDI that people with disability are facing in a school environment including using the wash facilities. There are 10 subsidies in Addis Ababa and the survey covered 231 primary and junior secondary schools and the result obtained is presented as follows. 26.1% of schools with one and more store of buildings are accessible by state. This means that people with disability, especially with mobility difficulties, are enabled to enter to the building so that they need one some, such kind, some kind of support to enter into the class. When it comes to the uh, toilet facilities, only 21.7% schools have accessible toilet, and 21.2% of all to toilets are accessible and comfortable. This means that most of students with disabilities are not using the toilet facility. 76.6% of roads to water taps are inaccessible, and in addition, the water taps themselves have two to three stages so that students with disabilities can't access them. The width of uh, the doors of a toilet are too narrow so that people using a wheelchair will not get in and they can't use these facilities. The picture shows that a water tap in a school compound having students from KG to junior secondary school level. All the beneficiaries are using the same uh, water tap, so the water tap is too uh, difficult for the KG student to use because it is above their height. This is a toilet located in a corner of a school and it is very far from other services of the school. The road to the toilet is very rough and people with disabilities are not using it easily. And it is also students, female students are not using this toilet because it's very far from other services and there is a high chance of uh, sexual harassment while using this toilet. Under standard, door of a toilet is not allowing students using a wheelchair to enter and to use them. A toilet with no enough space inside is very difficult to use for people using a wheelchair because it doesn't have space to tap and even to close the door. It is difficult to ride a wheelchair on sand, mud and slippy topography. Working using a crutch, a walker, and a, a breast is hard on some topography. The wash facility should also consider different topographies and climate in planning any construction. Who should participate on planning to construct wash facilities? Although accessibility has universal design, it is good to have a community representative from the community where the facility is going to be constructed. A say from a special need expert is an input. 
a designer architect with a knowledge of accessibility accessibility audit and standard is recommendation what facility should consider environmental effect the facility should be placed in a reasonable far place from other services different designs should be made for different target beneficiaries there is a need to think a holistic accessibility so that the entire environment will be used easily by people with, dis with disabilities and other beneficiaries. And thank you. Thank, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. I mean, we have very useful information that we can learn from. And um, definitely, this will help, really help us to move forward on this agenda. Uh, please continue to put your questions, your comments on, on the chat box in Partable. Then we'll come back to that when we come to Q&A session. Uh, now, let, let me just invite um, Honorable, Honorable Safia Nalule, the chairperson of Uganda's Equal Opportunities Commission and former national member of parliament in Uganda uh, to make a presentation. Honorable Safia, please. My name is Safia Nalule Juko. I'm the chairperson of the Equal Opportunities Commission, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm the former National Woman Member of Parliament representing persons with disabilities in the Parliament of Uganda. I thank World Water Week, Water Aid, and others for always selecting me to be among the presenters every year. The theme for today is how to make climate resilient wash participatory. Climate resilient wash can be defined as the ability to anticipate and prepare for and respond to hazardous events, trends, or disturbances related to climate. The participatory way to achieve this is uh, for the WASH actors and others who work with all people uh, to anticipate and prepare for the for and respond to these hazardous events related to climate. In order to do this, uh, they must have the following facts, the nature, structure setup, income earnings, living conditions of the affected people, locations, uh, hence diversities and the data. They must know the following hazardous events, trends or disturbances related to climate uh, and their effects on wash. Uh, first of all, floods, drought, global warming, landslides and others. If we start with the floods, the floods affect sanitation, damages, drainages. Uh, affects uh, waste, water waste water wastewater treatment, uh, con uh, contamination of water sources, and cause diseases like diarrhea. It is generally the poor and vulnerable people who live in the flood-prone areas. Drought and water shortage also has considerable impact on sanitation and hygiene. Waterborne toilets need a lot of water, washing hands all the time to be clean and to to, to avoid COVID-19 also needs water. People walk long distances uh, to get water during drought and use water from unpro um, unprotected sources during drought. They share water with animals, which leads to getting diseases. They, they walk in swamps in search of water with the fear to drown, like the blind people of Maoto. They, they, the young people are, are, are threatened by sexual harassment. They school drop out death for old and persons with disabilities to, due to inaccessibility and unaffordability uh, and, or, or to water due to the high costs. Landslides and global warming can lead to displacement, to refugee settlements with no access to clean and adequate water facilities, especially for children, persons with disabilities, old people and women. What causes all this? Poverty inaffordability and lack of access to and control of resources like land leads to lack of pressure uh, leads to land pressures uh, it leads also to settlement in water lodged places where water sanitation and hygiene is unavailable and highly compromised cutting of trees for settlement for fuel and selling for an income is also another cause ignorance of the outcomes of these activities to ecosystems uh, to climate and to wash 
uh, all these uh, causes. Exclusion in situational and policy analysis, planning, budgeting, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation is also another cause. What the what, what should the watch actors, uh, what do they need to think about uh, to know uh, and to do to make sure a climate resilient watch is participatory? Uh, they must have facts and statistical data on all people. They must listen to the needs of the people taking into consideration vulnerabilities and other diversities. Undertake inclusive research, planning, policy making, budgeting, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation. Uh, they should support alternative economic empowerment programs to lessen pressure on the environment. They should support people's access to and control over resources. Support the participatory designing, funding, and implementation of inclusive climate resilient policies, programs, and budgets. They should develop checklists of their of the people's needs to avoid leaving no one and no concern behind uh, the categories of people to ensure everybody's need is catered for. They should work with government development initiatives like the Gender and Equity Budgeting Initiative, which I initiated uh, me, Safia Danule Jugo, during my tenure in Parliament, and uh, other uh, government models like the Uganda Parish Development Model. Support such people with projects like water harvesting tanks, uh, as for us we in Huriweed, Human Rights of Women and Girls with Disabilities, uh, with the funding from World Fund for Nature, we constructed water harvesting tanks for women with disabilities. Also, Action on Disability and both men constructed boreholes for blind people in Maoto. In a similar manner, WASH actors can plan to take water and sanitation facilities to the one billion to the world one billion plus person disabilities. If all wash actors pull resources to construct water tanks and boreholes, accessible wash facilities like toilets for 200 billion person disabilities each year, in five years, all person disabilities in the world will be covered and they will be happy. Condition the water actors and the wash actors should condition their funding support to be inclusive to all people. They should help to plan climate resilient settlements, develop inclusive resilient practical and strategic wash coping mechanisms for the current and the future, construct water sources for all, and educate people on the need to protect ecosystems, planting trees, preserving water bodies, no encroachment on water bodies like dumping soil and plastics to reclaim land. Avoid any human activity which can result in floods, drought, global warming, and sensitize people on the dangers of such disastrous activities to their generation and the generation to come. Promote sustainable and optimal use of natural resources and minimizing the release of waste into the environment. Like poor people use plastic materials a lot, which takes thousands of years to decompose. They, they, they defecate in these plastic bags, dump them into sewage, and water sources. We should discourage them of such bad practices and we promote the use of degradable materials and construct proper toilets for them. Watch sectors should directly consult and work with the people concerned, especially the vulnerable people. My prayer is that let us live to see, benefit and enjoy the practical and participatory climate resilient wash, where wash actors can directly work and fund Watch facilities for the vulnerable people. The debates of the World Water Week must bear tangible results, theory to practice. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank, thank you so much, Honorable Safia, for your very useful comments and contributions. These are really appreciated. Uh, I will hand over to Elam to, uh, for the next activity. Elam, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, so we're back again with another uh, set of activities. Uh, so shall we see slide number eight, please? All right, so we heard quite a bit from different speakers about uh, climate building, climate resilient 
toilet facilities and water supplies. This is an example of many uh, of uh, wash activities that is happening by different organizations around the world to make sure that uh, toilet facilities are climate resilient. For example, uh, when there is uh, extreme heat or extreme cold weather, where there is flood, make sure that the uh, water sources are not contaminated. So a question that I have for you, based on what we just discussed in the previous activity and based on what, what you heard from uh, all speakers before me, is that when they're trying to build this uh, climate resilient wash facilities, toilets or water supplies, what are the possible barriers that uh, a person with a disability may face? Remember, we discussed that we need to uh, switch from various disability to various barriers. So can you think of some barriers that when building these facilities, persons with disabilities may face? And if you identify any barrier, so uh, can you identify what is the enabler to address each of that barrier? Again, referring back to what we discussed in previous activity. Uh, I hope we have the poll running. Yes, so we have the poll running. So let's give it a few more seconds. So uh, tell us about the barriers that a person with disability may face accessing these facilities and what would be the enabler to address that barrier? Face, what do we have so far? We have um, possible barriers. They are physical, uh, social, institutional, transportation, topography. Um, and the enablers, uh, we have education, so far. Yeah. So let's be a little bit more specific. So for example, um, physical barrier to access this uh, a, a toilet facility would be lack of uh, ramp when they're put a step or stair, a couple of stairs. So someone who uses a wheelchair or crutch cannot go there because there is, it's the, the path to the toilet itself is not accessible. Or when we talk about um, attitudinal barriers, it's about, okay, so we're building showers, but people with disabilities uh, can just use them like other people. They don't understand, they don't re uh, remember the extra wash or hygiene uh, requirements that some groups of persons with disabilities may have. Or in terms of institutional barrier, barrier we can talk about, like for example, in procurement policies that the organizations have, they do not consider accessibility. So they do not consider that when you're purchasing items, we need to make sure that the items you purchase to build a toilet or water supply should be accessible items. So it's not included in procurement policies based on uh, some institutional barrier. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. So this is another example. In many countries, we have been witnessing the wonderful uh, innovation of building solar water uh, water systems where they use uh, sol uh, solar energy to um, for access to water. So my question is that imagine that you are in a, a village or you are responsible to decide. Are you going to prioritize persons with disabilities in accessing these water systems? And if yes, why? Do you think that persons with disabilities should be prioritized in accessing these systems? So for example, if there are 200 households in a respective area that you're responsible to decide, are you going to uh, prioritize families with persons with disabilities or not? And if yes, why? If no, why? Try to write your answers in the chat box, in the poll, sorry. Do we have anything coming up, Faith? Yes, um, we have received a response that yes, um, we need to prioritize people with disabilities. I'm still waiting for the why. Yeah, why? Just because they have disability or there's another reason? 
Okay, there we are. Um, yes, we need to prioritize people with disabilities uh, for more accessible services. Um, yeah, that's what I could find. Oh, because um, it's a requirement of the SDGs. Um, uh, to remove barriers, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's for everyone, for accessibility for everyone. That's, uh, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your contributions. Uh, so we just heard from some of our colleagues that people with disabilities face additional barriers. So, you know, for example, in many areas, uh, people, uh, especially women, have to go long, long uh, day trips to catch, to fetch water. Sometimes they have to walk for two, three hours to fetch water. So when there is a woman with disability, usually it is not, not going to be easy. So these people face additional barriers in accessing water. Uh, so if there is a way to facilitate access to water, those who face more barriers should be prioritized, right? So we say, um, and also I was talking about the uh, hygiene requirements for persons with disabilities who might need assistance uh, for their hygiene services or make sure uh, to, to access wash facilities. So these households uh, need more water and need more frequency access to water. So uh, again, that's another reason. So probably we can say because they face additional barriers in accessing water, um, they should be prioritized. Also, if it's about a source of income to access water, probably as one of our colleagues was talking about poverty, that would be a very helpful way to uh, ensure better self-reliance and uh, independence for persons with disabilities and their households. Okay, let's move on to the next uh, slide. Here we are seeing a group of people getting training. Uh, so my question to you is that uh, when there is a training organized to, to teach the local community on a reduction of uh, water consumption or protecting, uh, uh, practicing more climate resilient wash uh, practices, um, what are the barriers that some of the persons with disabilities may face, um, including physical, communication, attitudinal, and institutional? And what are the bar enablers for each of them to make sure that they can equally access this training? So feel free to put your answers in the chat box. Yeah, imagine that you're organizing a training for a group of persons with disability, for a group of community uh, people in a village, in a small town to teach them how to reduce water consumption, how to practice uh, climate resilient uh, wash, sanitation, hygiene, water consumption. And uh, you're asking them to, uh, to participate in this training. What are the barriers that persons with disabilities face and how we can address those barriers? Faith, do we have anything in the chat box? Yes, responses that have come through now, it's communication and physical barriers. Yeah, for example, deaf people will not be able to participate if we have, we do not provide uh, sign language interpretation. So this is an example of um, communication barrier. Or if the training area is not physically accessible for those who wheelchair, then there would be an issue for them to access the training session. All right, thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this uh, quick activity and this has helped to um, uh, sh uh, enhance some of, the some of our participants' knowledge and sensitivity about disability inclusion. Thank you very much. Back to you, Bisu. Thank you so much. And I'm definitely, we've learned so much from your activity and presentation. And um, we have to make a definite effort to identify the barriers persons with disabilities face in assessing what disabilities. And more importantly, we have to plan uh, and implement programs to address these barriers and meet the worst needs of persons with disabilities. 
So I think um, we've learned so much. Thank you so much, Elam. Um, I think we have, let's, let's, let's move, let's go ahead, I mean, uh, to save time. So just permit me to share uh, a video uh, from UNICEF on innovation to make latrines in emergencies accessible for persons with disabilities. The whole idea is that whether the emergency is a result of climate change or other disasters or for population displayed by conflicts, persons with disability need to have a safe and accessible latrines, uh, accessible access to latrines. So I think this is another for the evidence to show how we can integrate um, uh, inclusiveness in our design. Over to you, please. Let's have the video. There's no sound on the video. No sound, please. Are we, are we having challenges with that? Minara, 21. Oh, mama. Oh. The clothes I had in Myanmar were beautiful, but I could only bring one dress with me. Manira Begum, Hashim's mother. Hashim can't walk properly. My other son had to carry him. Sometimes I carried him. On the way, I would sometimes fall, but I'd always get up again. My grandmother carried me all the way here. My parents died while we were running away. Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh. One in ten Rohingya refugee households includes a person living with a disability. When we arrived, there were no toilets, so we had to go to a nearby forest. Martin Worth, UNICEF Bangladesh. I think the major challenge in emergencies is the, is the speed. You need to make, uh, you need to provide services quickly. Maksuda Sultana, Care Bangladesh. When the influx began in 2017, it was an emergency situation, so we built the latrines with that in mind. I used to carry him to the toilet, but it was hard for him to use. John Miguel Okech, Care Bangladesh. Some of this environment, sometimes you find the terrain is not very friendly for persons with disability. When I go for walks, my legs hurt. Bashir Ahmed, a Rohingya refugee who is blind. In Myanmar, the ground was flat so I could walk easily, but here it's all uneven. I worry I'll trip over something or fall in the gutter. Apart from the actual access to the, to the, to the latrine itself, our standard design is, is using a squatting plate. Uh, persons with disability, for them to squat is very, very challenging. It gets very, very uh, uncomfortable. Yeah. It's hard for me to use those toilets. We came to a certain census that why, why can't we do a trial pilot of a latrine with certain add-ons? Wash here in Cox's Bazaar are working with uh, the supply section to pilot a more friendly design of latrines for, for people living with disabilities. It's more of a design where they can sit down rather than having to squat. Camp 16. We talked to all the persons with disabilities in Camp 16 using a set of questions to find out what features they needed, where their latrine should be located, what would make it more comfortable. Noor Aisha, 12. 
It's better because it's closer to our home. I'm able to sit on it and hold the handles. He can lean against it. It's quite comfortable for him now. There is also a railing on the path. It's easy for me to use. There is soap and water. I like it. This latrine is in a learning center, and it means I don't have to leave school to, to go and use the bathroom. Sometimes, Rajuma would get upset because the other kids would say, you only got this toilet because you're disabled. Through our hygiene promotion interactions within the school, we really wanted to take that away from the minds of the children, that this latrine is for this child because the child is, has uh, challenges with movement and that sort of thing. No, it's for everyone. So everyone is equal. And that has made uh, the child opening up in schools. And the teachers were able to tell us that. After we installed these latrines, the children were happy. I think these products should be included in the response to any future emergency. They should be built into the response. Now I can go to the toilet by myself. I feel better. It would be good if more of the trains like this were built for other people with disabilities. It would be nice if you could build a toilet like the one at school, but near my house. One day he'll grow up. If he's able to get around by himself and keep himself neat and tidy, I'll be very happy. If I can be around other people and be healthy, then I'll be happy. UNICEF continues to innovate assistive technology solutions to fulfill the rights of children with disabilities. UNICEF for every child. Uh, th thank you so much. I think um, we have to going to make them happy. I mean, we have to make sure that we have activities, programs that are inclusive enough to consider the needs of persons with disability. So now I think now it's time for questions and answers. So. Uh, we have the next couple of minutes. We are already losing time uh, to answer questions, receive comments. Already we have some few questions, and we're going to have um, uh, some panelists to uh, answer those questions. We have Yosef Fekadu and the Elam Yosef and to serve as the panelists to answer those questions. And then if they, if they can come online, then I will just go straight uh, to ask them some questions we've already received. And um, for Utopia, Joseph, I hope you are there. The question to you, please listen very well. The question to you, Joseph, in Utopia, only a small proportion of schools have disability accessible toilets. Can you give an example of how your organization is working to make washing schools more accessible for children with disabilities? Did you get that, Joseph? Yourself? Okay, if you don't have yourself, maybe, yeah, I, okay. Yeah. Okay, yourself, did you get the question? Which page that was again? Did you get the question? I should repeat the question? You can repeat the question as well. Okay, yeah, the question for one of our colleagues is that in Ethiopia, only a small proportion of schools have disability accessible toilets. Can you give an example of how your organization is working to make washing schools more accessible for children with disabilities? Please just spend about one or two minutes to explain this. Over to you, Yusuf. I continue? Yeah, please go ahead. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that's right. Well, there are uh, very few uh, schools have accessible toilets in Ethiopia, in all, in all, all over the country. Uh, because this accessibility is uh, more or less uh, new for our, our society. So what we are doing is <coughs> uh, 
we try to uh, form some model uh, access of wash facilities like a toilet and a water tub. Then we try to uh, focus on training uh, the food community so that they can have this type of uh, facilities uh, with with uh, the materials around them. So they, it couldn't be, it's not, no need to be a very expensive one or no need to be uh, an important one, but they can do it with uh, local materials and we, we try to train them so that they can have at least one accessible toilet at the Thank, thank you so much. Uh, although your voice was not very clear, so if 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 possible, maybe you can put your response in the chat chat box so that colleagues can get the response very clearly. And um, can I put it in the chat box? Yes, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Put okay. it in the chat box. I'll put, so that, I'll put there. Yes. I'll put there. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And the question for Elan, please just spend one minute because we are running short of time. Uh, why is there a dis disproportionate people with disability living in developing countries? Why do we have more people with disability living in developing countries? You want to throw more insight on that? Elan, over to you. Just one minute, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. All right. So uh, the answer is actually uh, lies in what we just discussed about definition of disability, because there are more barriers in uh, developing countries, uh, especially for access to the environment. Um, institutional barriers. So uh, people with this, people who have impairment face more disability because we said that disability is a result. So um, I don't want to go into the conversation about uh, how many people with impairment live in developing countries compared to developed countries because that takes us to another layer which we don't want to enter. But the quick answer is that because there are more barriers, um, of course, this is an assumption, but I guess uh, most of the cases are, for example, one of our colleagues was mentioning about connection between poverty. So, for example, when uh, there is less accessible environment, people who have impairment face more disabilities. And that's why uh, we can see that more people with disabilities live in developing countries. But that's a huge conversation that we can continue. It not, doesn't really fit in one minute. Back to you. Thank you so much for that insight. Yeah, we have one of our colleagues, Marius Adeo. Your hands is up. Uh, please, can you unmute and come in? We just have one minute, please, for your question. Okay. Over to you. Thank Marius. you, sir. Thank you, sir. In fact, uh, I do not have access to the chat bus. If not, I would have dropped some of my questions over there. We are talking about um, disabilities people access to sanitation and water infrastructure. In, for, for example, in, in a, a locality where uh, there is no uh, people living with disabilities, how do you want, I mean, um, how can we consider that when we are talking about inclusion in sanitation, do we need to systematically um, provide those uh, facilities for sanitation and water infrastructure, or we need to make a census first. And from which states, like from which percentage of uh, uh, people living with dis disabilities can we consider building infrastructure with uh, these facilities access? Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Marius. Elam is already on standby to, to answer. The, Elam, you want to come in briefly to answer Marius' comments? Hello, may I say something? Elam? Or, or Joseph, any one of you can come yeah. in. Joseph, okay, please yeah, come in. Yeah, Joseph. let me, co yes. let me yeah, comment. Please come in. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, we have to have uh, uh, these facilities in the school, whether we have a disabled student or not, because we don't know where we get disability, where we get such problems uh, in our school. So that we have to have this facility in a reasonable way so that in case we have a disabled student, they can accommodate us.
Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your comments. Yes, uh, we are running short of time. Please continue to have the, uh, your comments in the chat box. We'll collate all these things, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have another forum to discuss more in depth on this. So we are running short of time. And uh, just to say that, please, um, the, the link to the, uh, the What is Ability Results page and the call for action is in the first party. Please go there, you see all the information. So at this stage, I, I would like to invite, uh, we have to wrap up. I, I, I would like to invite Chilufia Chileshe, Global Policy Director of Water Aid, to give the closing remarks. Apologies, I didn't get the name very well. Apologies about that. Please, Chilufia, please come in and present the closing remarks and wrap up the session for us. Over to you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, no, you pronounced my name uh, just fine. So my name is Chilufia. Uh, really delighted to join this session. And I think it was, um, you will all agree, very insightful. Uh, I, I think it's always a useful time to sit back, reflect on how we are doing and what the various challenges that face us in the wash sector uh, in responding to the needs uh, across the globe. So um, it's my first time to this session, but I'm, I, I understand that this is the third annual event on disability at Stockholm World Water Week. Um, it's a demonstration of how this collaboration is growing, the extent to which um, partners are putting in the effort to make sure that we work together to drive this agenda in a very um, concerted way, uh, push it, putting our energy where it needs to be, thinking carefully about what uh, the various kinds of uh, disability, which we have been told today are the barriers that people face, but also understanding that people have various kinds of impairments and therefore it means that understanding that uh, and responding in ways that minimize the barriers for them is always going to be really critical. So, I mean, I don't need to repeat this for you because it's been a very insightful session. Um, the one thing that's uh, important to, to think about now is that in this third year, especially when we are online, and have much more participation. And we've been told again, participation that's meaningful uh, from colleagues all across the world, facilitated by, by the internet, thankfully, but also colleagues from uh, uh, with different kinds of, of impairments. Um, and that's included um, people with uh, impairments, uh, intellectual impairments and other kinds. So this is really a, a gain and a big plus for this collective and the work that you are doing. So um, just reflecting on what I've heard today, because that's what I was asked to do in, in terms of this closing remarks. Um, I definitely can't do justice to everything that we have heard, but I, I have five points that, that stand out for me. So the first is uh, interestingly reflecting on uh, Thomas Christensen's uh, opening remarks. I think for me, that's just a demonstration of the role of partners and partnerships, which is what we are doing here. And for the third year in a row that uh, Water Aid, UNICEF, Help Aid International, um, um, the World Bank, International Disability Alliance have been able to do this for a, for a third year running. It's really a reminder that that um, you know actors and organizations and donor governments and development partners have a big role to play in ensuring that we can continue to support this work, but also continue to spotlight the solutions. Um, that, that we need to be surfacing every year and every day in all of our programs, our policy work and so on. The second for me was that, you know, I guess this continuous reminder that it is the barriers and not the impairments uh, that people have that are most often the problem. Uh, and so thinking about that, remembering that in our work uh, and also recognizing that the intersection of people's identities means that some of those barriers get heightened. And so in, in when we are thinking about what it means for accessing WASH for people, especially in this time when the effects of climate change are higher, what do we need to be thinking about? What needs to be in place? And we've heard some really good examples today. So that reminder for me is one that we need to take away. The other is um, this whole idea that WASH is essential to driving resilience in communities, uh, including climate resilience. So how do we ensure that, that uh, those WASH services are inclusive that they respond to, to the different um, uh, needs that, that people with impairments uh, have, but also that we are thinking carefully about what barriers we might be building into some of those responses and that infrastructure, that, uh, that wash infrastructure that we are putting out there. So how do we uh, proactively uh, ensure that we are addressing that? 
The third point, the fourth now, sorry, the fourth point um, came through from an example from Uganda for me, and it was a really strong one. So this idea that we can use existing um, policy development whether uh, uh, and, and programming to really embed uh, these responses to, um, to the barriers affecting people uh, and driving marginalization. So how do you use uh, gender or women's empowerment programming? How do you use uh, ongoing policy making or policy reform? How do you, do you uh, take advantage of budgeting processes to ensure that we're building the capacity in all of the countries uh, that we live in to address those challenges and really strengthening the systems uh, in which we have to deliver these wash services. Uh, the next point for me is a question of power uh, and that came out quite strongly as we were discussing the fact that uh, by continuing to ignore the challenges um, as well as the barriers that are sometimes inbuilt in the wash responses if they are not thinking carefully about disability and age, we are, we are disempowering uh, people more and more. Uh, and so people that have power to uh, uh, ensure that, that there is adequate participation, meaningful participation, need to use that power in ways that, uh, um, that facilitate that participation of people in decision-making, of people that uh, have to deal with these kinds of uh, barriers every day in designing infrastructure. And that's what we've heard today. Um, I guess, the, before I, I get to my last point, I, I've also been asked to remind you that, um, that there is a new disability and age inclusive WASH page, a web page, which is in place and it's been announced already in this session, but uh, really important that we, we come back to that. Uh, it, it's, it's a collective effort. It will be updated frequently, but there's also a request that everybody on this, um, on this session contribute to that proactively. So do get in touch with the organizers and people that are putting this together, the, co the collective, to ensure that you, we can add to this and grow it and, and improve its impact. Um, I guess final thought from me is really reflecting on just what um, might be seen as simple accommodations when we think about addressing those barriers that we, we have learned about in those very, um, interactive uh, activities we've done today is, is a is slightly personal reflection, right? So I, I work at WaterAid as policy director, which is a really exciting job, thinking about how do we uh, respond and find solutions to the worst challenges through our policy work. Um, and I often find myself, particularly in a session like this one, thinking about one of the most influential people in my life, who was my primary school teacher, who was visually impaired. Uh, and frequently I, I drive down my, my street in Lusaka where I live and I see small girls and boys on the street that are visually impaired. They can't be in school. Sometimes it's because the infrastructure doesn't support them. Sometimes it's because the toilet just isn't uh, appropriate or, or that they, 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 the school infrastructure itself doesn't support them. Um, and that in the larger context of communities that are facing climate change and their problems are worsening, um, you, you know, we have to keep challenging ourselves that those small boys and girls can, can actualize themselves, can, can be the inspiration uh, to other people as, me, as my teacher was to me, a visually impaired man that I can't forget today because of the influence he had and the opportunity uh, he had uh, because a poorly designed toilet did not stop him. Sorry, BC. I mean, that, that story always uh, <laughs> fires me up and I hope it fires you up too. But I'm going to end Definitely. now. And I, <laughs> in ending, I have to read only uh, three calls to action. And that's my one minute of closing. So the first call to action is for all WASH actors to identify organizations of persons with disabilities and organizations of older persons in your context to partner with on to partner with on inclusion, inclusive wash and climate change programs. The second call to action is for governments to consider the ways that climate events and natural disasters disproportionately impact access to wash for older persons and persons with disabilities. And the third call to action is for governments and wash actors to identify barriers to inclusive wash and work together with older persons and persons with disabilities to find solutions to design and implement resilient wash interventions and adaptations that leave no one behind, regardless of gender, age, or disability. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much. Thanks for your participation. We really appreciate your contribution. Colleagues, thanks so much for your participation. Wish you all the best. Apologies if you're taking a little bit more of your time. We wish you a very fruitful week ahead of us. We have a lot of sessions. So all the best. Thanks so much and bye for now.